And now, for our featured presentation. You are watching the Jonathan Desvernay Gospel Channel. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. It is time to hear our inspirational speaker. He's one of the most sought after conference and conventional speakers in Central Texas. He is a prolific teacher with an insight, pastoral heart, and special evangelistic boldness. He presents the uncompromising gospel with clarity and effectiveness, teaching the appropriation of God's word. He was born and reared in Houston, Texas, and attended Houston Public School. He's a graduate of the Texas Christian University, holding a bachelor's degree in elementary education. He's also, he also attended the C.H. Mason System of Bible Colleges. In 1991, he organized an assemblage of Praise Church in Byron, Texas. Today, he is the personal executive assistant to Bishop Rufus Kyle, Jr., prelate of Tennessee Southeast Number 1 and the jurisdictional business manager. He also serves as district superintendent of the Groverstone Crockett District. Groveston Crockett District. In August 2005, he was appointed pastor of the Greater Old Field Church of God in Christ and is presently serving as pastor of the Great Old Field Church, the Hampton Memorial Church of God in Christ in Texas, and the Assemblage of Praise Church in Texas. He ministers extensively through revivals and conferences throughout the nation and is seen weekly on television in Houston County. His ministry expanded over 150 plus cities, 49 states, and countless pastors and ministers opportunities to numerous names. He was appointed the Deputy Commissioner of Security for the Church of God in Christ by Bishop Charles Blake, Sr. The Superintendent Thomas is married to the talented Kimberly Reed Thomas, who is a renowned psalmist in her own right. Saints of God, welcome with me, Superintendent Kirk L. Thompson. Dear Lord, anoint this word. I honor the Lord for the privilege of coming tonight. Thank God for our presiding bishop, Bishop Blake, and to the first and second assistant presiding bishops, respectively, members of the general board, Bishop Sheard and the board of bishops, to uh, Lady May Blake, and all of you that serve in the feminine side of our ministry, my own bishop, Bishop Rufus Kyles, and his wife, Louisa, and my supervisor, Supervisor Lena McLean. I've been asked to make my remarks short, so I'll call your attention <laughs> to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16 records, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. But woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. For we cannot but speak the thing that we have seen and heard. Why must we preach? It is interesting to note that Paul, the great missionary, went on four missionary journeys. While on these journeys, Paul's mission was to preach the gospel. His mission was to preach the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the Gentile nations. 
as he traveled from city to city and from place to place, Paul would found churches. He would set up churches and he would stay with that church until it was strong enough to operate without him. Then he would move on to yet other places and set up other churches. It is said that when Paul first went to Corinth, that there were many things at work to try to hinder and hold up the power and progress of the church. He began his teachings at first by preaching in the synagogues. However, he was put out of them and was compelled to give his instructions in private homes. It is said that this church at Corinth was at best described as a hell-raising church. Paul heard some disturbing news concerning the state of things at the church and therefore he wrote this first epistle to address the many issues that plagued the Corinthian church. One of the problems that was prevalent in this Corinthian church was there were those there who could not understand the resurrection. They had mistaken views concerning the resurrection. They could not understand how one could be dead. The diastolic and systolic beat of one's heart having come to a stop. And then to say that he got up again on the third day. Their Grecian logic, their Greek mentality would not allow them to grasp the idea that one could be dead and three days later get up. But I heard Paul say unto them, if Christ be not risen, then I preaching and I labor and our faith is in vain. There was a second problem prevalent in this Corinthian church. There were those there who ate the meat that had been offered to idol gods. And this practice was causing the weaker Christians to stumble and fall by the wayside. Paul heard this news and he said to them in so many words, now, now if you eat this meat, it won't make you any better. And if you don't eat it, it won't make you any worse. But if eating this meat offends your brother, then don't you eat it any longer. And still yet, there was a third problem in this Corinthian church. There was what I have identified as the party spirit. No, they were not Democrats or Republicans or Tea Party participants. But some followed Apollos. Some followed Paul. Some followed Cephas. And still yet others claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ. Paul heard this news and he said to them, what's wrong with you? Is Christ divided? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, I thank God I didn't baptize none of you. I'm nothing big, I'm just a preacher. Apollos and Cephas, they're nothing big. We're all just preachers. We don't have the power to save anybody. This is what happens. I plant another waters, but only God can give the increase. It is then that Paul speaks the immortal words of our text. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. But woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul was saying to them, in essence, it would have been better for me had I not been born than for me to refuse to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul wanted them to understand the seriousness of the call to preach. And oh yes, we preachers, we must understand the seriousness of the call to preach. God has not called us to be gospel comedians. Nor has he called us to be ecclesiastical clowns. But he has called us to preach the gospel. Yet the question remains, why must we preach? Is preaching still 
necessary. Isn't it outdated? Isn't preaching antiquated? Why must we resort to listening to the gospel in order for us to make it? In this age of technology, in this age of computers, in this age of iPads and smartphones, isn't that enough for us to live by? Why must we resort to listening to the gospel in order for us to make it? In this age, of the philosophical views of secular humanism which declare that man does not need God and he can solve his own problems. Can't Iana fix our life? Where is Dr. Phil? Why must we resort to listening to the gospel in order for us to make it in this age of psychologists like Skinner and others with their theories on behavior modification. Isn't that enough for us to live by? Well, I've got three reasons and I'm going to hurry, hurry to my seat. First of all, we must preach because our times demand it. My brothers and sisters, we are living in some terrible times. We're living in a day when sin and evil are riding on the high cloud while righteousness and morality are at their lowest. Ours is a time when men are not concerned about the needs of their brother. Ours is a time when we have too many priests and Levites who pass by on the other side. Ours is a time of drug abuse. When drugs have infiltrated even our elementary schools. Therefore, I came to St. Louis to declare that preaching is in order. Ours is a time of babies having babies. I said preaching is in order. Ours is a time when if a poor boy steals a bicycle, he goes to prison. But if a rich boy shoots a president, he goes to a nursing home. I said preaching is in order. Therefore, we must preach because our times demand it. But not only must we preach because our times demand it, but we must preach because man can only be saved through the preaching of the gospel. No, you are not saved by your works. No, you are not saved by keeping the law. No, you are not saved by keeping the commandments. For it is by grace, through faith are we saved, and not of works, lest any man should boast. God sent his word through the preacher. Had he sent it only by radio, you may not have been listening. Had he sent it only by television, you may not have been watching. Had he sent it only by newspaper, you may not have read it. But he sent his word through the preacher. Thus I hear Paul saying unto them, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? That gives us to know you must have a sent preacher in order for us to hear. You must hear in order for us to believe. You must believe in order for us to call. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord be saved. Shout yes. Tap your hands and say yes, Lord. So we must preach because our times demand it. We must preach because man can only be saved through the preaching of the gospel. We must preach because necessity is laid upon us. Paul said, though I preach the gospel, I have no cause to become arrogant and haughty and lifted up in pride. 
for necessity was laid upon me. Truth of the matter is, I really didn't want to preach. I was a protester, not a preacher. And I was on my way down to Damascus to further persecute the Christian movement. But something happened to me between leaving and arriving in Damascus. And I've never been the same ever since. He said necessity was laid upon me. I heard Moses say, I was minding my own business on the backside of a mountain, keeping watch over my father-in-law's flock. When I heard the voice out of the bush, said, take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. He said, necessity was laid upon me. I heard Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, I'm not going back to that church. I'm not going to deal with those devilish deacons or those tricky trustees. He said, I'm not going back. But that night, it was like fire. Therefore, we must preach because our times demand it. We must preach because man can only be saved through the preaching of the gospel. We must preach because necessity is laid upon us. I've got to close. But I believe over in the book of Acts that they told Peter and John, they said, don't preach anymore. Said to Peter and John, don't teach anymore about Jesus and his love. They said to Peter and John, you got to stop that preaching thing because you are upsetting our economy. You got to stop preaching because you are about to turn our world upside down. They said to Peter and John, stop preaching. But I heard Peter and John say unto them, we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. They said, we like to stop preaching, but we can't because we've seen too much. We saw him open blinded eyes. We saw him make the lame to walk. We saw him open deaf ears. We'd like to stop preaching, but we can't because we've seen too much. We saw him when he ascended up to God. And then we saw him when he appeared in the house without ever opening up the door. We cannot stop preaching because we've seen too much. But not only have we seen too much, but we cannot stop preaching because we've heard too much. Uh, we heard him when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. I can't hear no bar. We like to stop preaching but we can't because we've heard too much. We heard him when he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm meek and lowly and my yoke is easy and my burden is light I can't hear no bar say yes Lord we'd like to stop preaching but we can't because we heard too much we heard him when he said I am the resurrection and the life and though a man die yet shall he live again but if he lives and believes in me he'll never die I can't hear nobody shout yes we like to stop preaching but we can't because we've seen too much and we've heard too much but not only have we seen too much not only have we heard too much but we cannot stop preaching because we felt too much it was on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Ghost came in like a mighty rushing wind. 
we felt the power of the Holy Ghost running through our bodies and we found ourselves speaking in unknown tongues I can't hear nobody shout yes we cannot stop preaching because we've seen too much we've heard too much and we felt too much and I don't know about you but I just believe when you see something when you heard something and when you felt something you don't mind telling the world what you seen what you heard and what do you felt I've seen something I've heard something I felt something I've seen the lightning flashing heard the thunder roar failed sin breakers dashing trying to conquer my soul I heard the voice of Jesus telling me fight on shout yes tell your neighbor say neighbor We've got to preach. Souls are dying, and we've got to preach. Cause man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Let's give God a praise for the spoken word. Administrator Kurt Thompson, God bless you, Elder Thompson. It is now my privilege and it is my honor to be able to present to you God's man, God's choice, the one that God has smiled upon to elevate, to lead the greatest people in the world, and that is the saints of God. And so we're going to hear from God's chosen as he comes to speak to us and encourage our hearts. Will you rise to your feet as we will listen to the voice of our presiding bishop, Bishop Charles E. Blake. Receive ye him. He cannot fail, for he is God. He cannot fail, he pledged his word. He cannot fail, he'll see you through. He cannot fail, he'll answer. Look over at your neighbor and testify to your neighbor and tell them, He cannot fail, for He is God. He cannot fail. He cannot fail. He pledged His word. He pledged His word. He cannot fail. He cannot fail. He'll see you through. He'll see you through. He cannot fail. He'll answer. Clap your hands, everybody, and give praise to the Lord. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Let's praise God for Pastor Kurt Carr. Kurt Thompson. Kurt Thompson. Pastor Kurt Thompson. <laughs> what a message. Sometimes when you say the first name, you can't get away from the last name. Pastor Kurt Thompson is such a beloved man of God. He serves the church as a security man and stays around with me almost 24 seven during the convention, doing everything he can to make us safe and make us comfortable. 
and that he, having such a gift of ministry, would have such a spirit of servanthood. It's altogether amazing. Let's clap our hands and praise God for Pastor Kurt Thompson. We love him so much, and we appreciate him and all of the adjutants and all of the security that stay so close around the general board. But all of you stand, all of the adjutants and security that help the presiding bishop general board driving to the airport, running errands and singing about us. Let's give them a rousing applause. These are the men. Keep us safe and make us comfortable. And then this mass choir, weren't they awesome tonight in the special ensemble? Praise God for all of them. Praise God for all of them. Come on, people of the Lord. We've got the best music in the world. Clap your hands and praise God for each of them. Bishop Brooks and Bishop Macklin and all the members of the general board. This is one of the hardest working general boards in the history of the church. And our days start early in the morning, eight o'clock meetings, seven o'clock meetings in the morning. And all day long, they're busy, they're working. And even into the night, they're busy and working. And by the time they're able to get a little rest, the day has started again. And back to work, they must go. This general board is committed to the Church of God in Christ, to the advancement of the work of the Lord. And let's give the general board members a rousing applause. Thank God for all of them. Praise God for our First Lady, Lady May Blake. Let's praise God for her. Assistant Supervisor Mother, River, Mother Lewis and Mother Rivers in her absence, we also honor her. And so it's just good to be here. Tell your neighbor it's good to be here. We've been planning and working and getting ready. I guess Sister Blake starts past packing about a month before the Holy Convocation. Getting her special preparation made for all the things that she is going to be involved in. Is there something called a day with Lady May coming up this week? Morning gyms, morning gyms. And she's going to share with the ladies on this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock. Amen. And of course, she's been getting ready for that. She has something wonderful for the women of the Church of God in Christ. We've got ecumenical guests with us. Dr. Floyd Flakes from New York, the a &E Church. God bless you. Stand up, Pastor Floyd Flakes, former congressman and dynamic leader of the church, and what a fantastic ministry they have in the city of New York. He's going to be our preacher on tomorrow night, and we're excited about it the time that he will spend with us. Dr. Timothy Clark is here also from Ohio. Would you stand, please? And let's give a rousing applause to him. Evangelist Harold Woodson, I guess he's consecutively been with us time and time again in this holy convocation. Let's praise God for him. Give him a rousing applause. All ministers from other denominations who are not members of the Church of God in Christ but you're visiting with us in this holy convocation in the city of St. Louis. Will you please stand, wherever you may be, stand. Stand, please, wherever you may be. Let's give our guest ministers a rousing applause. On Saturday, I'll be meeting with the bishops and with the pastors and with the elders got a wonderful surprise for all of you and we want you to come and hear what I have to say and hear what those whom I will present have to say to us. I think it's going to be one of the most significant gatherings that we have ever had in our time together as bishop, our presiding bishop and the bishops and elders. We're going to start an hour early on that Saturday. We're starting at 10 a.m. And we are inviting all the bishops and all the pastors to meet with us. I believe this was missions night, am I correct? 
Bishop Moody and the missionaries were presented and shared, and I'm sure that they are still somewhere in the room. All foreign missionaries and foreign workers and guests from outside of the United States. Would you please stand now? We want to recognize you again. Those who will be presented on tonight, stand please. These are our mission workers. This is the missions department. Amen. We love you and we praise God for you. I don't know where all I went this year, but I've been out of the country visiting brothers and sisters. I was in Kenya and Uganda, and it seems like the first of the year or early in the year, I was in Haiti and uh, have been moving around. Bishop Macklin is just returning from Nigeria. Bishop Macklin, come and stand beside me just for a moment. We're about to give in just a moment, and someone is going to come to lead us in the ministry of giving. But we want you to know how important and how significant it is that you share, that you give, that you help us, <clears throat> that you participate in everything that we are doing overseas. Fifty-seven nations of the world are impacted by our ministry. Let's clap our hands and praise God for that. Recently, it was our privilege to consecrate 18 bishops in the nation of Nigeria. Bishop Macklin has just returned from a visit with him. I gave a small gift to sponsor that trip, that journey, and that time together of about $20,000 just to make sure that everything went well. Let's receive Bishop Jerry Macklin, and then we will move into the receiving of the offering after he has spoken. God bless you. Thank you very much, Bishop Blake, and to all of the members of the General Board who are here tonight, and to my own wife, uh, First Lady Macklin, to all of the ladies who are in leadership of our church. Bishop Blake, you're right. I had just returned from Nigeria, and what an experience it was. About seven or eight years ago, we went to Nigeria to consecrate those 18 bishops. So we went back. Bishop was invited back, but he had just returned from Africa, and I was asked to go and was honored to go. But as I sat there, first of all, in a church that a young man built, and he modeled it after Los Angeles. And I'm here to tell you, any pastor up here would be glad to have that church in their city. It's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, big, beautiful church, marble everywhere. I said, oh my goodness. But as I sat there that day, all of those bishops who had been appointed, 15 of them or 16 of them all came that day when I was there, were there for a few days, and they all came and made a report. And I sat there with tears in my eyes. I could hardly believe my ears. And one bishop after another stood up and said, the Lord is blessing me. And I'm here to report that I have 250 churches. And the next one came and said, I've got 300 churches. And the next one came and said, I've got 450 churches. And the list went on and on and on. One man in particular talked about the Lord blessing him to establish churches, and he was establishing churches in an in, in Islamic territory. And everything in North Nigeria uh, is extremely violent. And when you set up churches there, you take your life into your own hands. The Church of God in Christ, as I listened to those bishops come one behind the other, they were so excited to be a part of the Church of God in Christ. Most of them will never have the privilege to come, but they were so welcoming and wanted me to know what they were doing, tell Bishop Blake we're doing this, we're doing that. They were so excited to be a part of this. And it would not have happened had it not been for a visionary leader who saw something in that country. And today, Nigeria is outpacing every country in the world in terms of the growth of the Church of God in Christ. There is an excitement there. There is an excitement, and it almost reminds you of the way that Kojic was perhaps 40, 50, 60 years ago when people had an excitement and believed that God could do anything but fail. One pastor was in the church, and while he was in the church, the Muslims came, Islamic terrorists came, and burnt the church up with the Church of God in Christ pastor inside. Burnt the church down and burnt the pastor up. Church of God in Christ. 
Brothers and sisters, two weeks later, the pastor's wife was back in the same city announcing the church will continue and took up the ministry and kept going. When you have that kind of excitement, they don't really worry about what they have to wear, how they look, etc. They're just putting all they have on the line. And they're trying to win everybody they can for Jesus. That's happening all over this country, all over this world, because of the ministry of the Church of God in Christ. In Haiti, you were so kind to work with the presiding bishop's vision, and we saw the Lord work, and we saw you give, and we saw a, a country that was devastated by that terrible earthquake come back alive. And if you ever go to Haiti now, and I want to thank Sister Macklin, who's going with me twice now, but if you ever go to Haiti now, you will see an entire complex. They call them compounds over there. And when you look at it, it just makes you want to stick your chest out and lift your hands up and say, Lord, I want to thank you. And those little girls were living in a house all crowded together. It was so bad that when I went there the first time and we walked in that place and they had a box that had some old fish in it. And the fish was just dry and little bugs and everything was all over the fish and they had them in a box. I said, what is this? And they said, well, that's, I said, no, 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 we can't do that. Get rid of stuff. We're not doing that. And the Lord began to move on the heart of our leader and all of those young girls who were crowded into that house, that little house, because the orphanage had fallen down, through the vision, a new orphanage was built. This two-story orphanage is absolutely wonderful. You should have seen the faces on those little girls when they moved them from the old house where they were crowded into two or three rooms into a great big modern orphanage facility that would be looking good on anybody's church campus. The orphanage is there. The medical clinic is now open and people line up early in the morning to get into the clinic to be seen. Thank God for the Church of God in Christ. All on one campus. The cathedral is there. And what a beautiful church it is. The Church of God in Christ is moving around the world here, Brazil, and as we travel this world, we're watching what God is doing, and it's all because we're willing to give of ourselves. Would you say with me, anybody wrapped up in themselves makes a small package. I rest my case. Bishop Blake, thank you again for the opportunity to serve, and I hope that all of us tonight will be a part of what God is going to do in this place. Let's touch the world for Jesus. God bless your heart. I want you now to fasten your safety belts. We're getting ready to taxi out now and getting ready to take off. We're going to hear from a young man that is God has certainly anointed. He hails from the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's a man of vision, purpose, and prayer. His primary mission is to fulfill the call of God on his life, which is proclaim and proclaim the uncompromising word of God. Saints of God, it was in the year of 1981 that I've heard him testify how he lay dead being struck by lightning while working for Republic Airlines in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. When he was revived some 45 minutes later, it was concluded by attending physicians that he would be a vegetable the rest of his life. But thank God for God. Thank God for God. After overcoming amnesia in the days that followed, Bishop Hines' commitment to fulfill his hunger and thirst for righteousness found him answering the call of God. This young man, his evangelistic journey has encompassed travel throughout the United States, Africa, and Germany. Bishop Hines has been committed to winning souls into the body of Christ. But let me tell you what I personally know about this young man. 
He is a true modern day apostle. In the city of Milwaukee, he went where there was nothing and established a memorial to God that glorifies the name of Jesus and the church of God in Christ. The uniqueness of this young man is this. Many of us, including myself, have done parachurch ministries, but many of us have done it with grants and with government funds. But this young man has three schools, K through 12 and a Bible college, all built through tithe and offering. To God be the glory. Something unique about the character of this preacher. His father in his senior years, pastored for many years. This young man goes to his father and says, Daddy, you come on and join me. And he joined with his father and made his father a co-pastor and paid him a comfortable salary up until his father died. This is a young man that respects seniors and he certainly loves God. One of the uniqueness, one of the unique things about this preacher, he has a loving wife, a loving family, and he certainly brings dignity in these days and times when what we see on television, he really brings a dignity to the church of God in Christ. I'm honored to present tonight Bishop Daryl Hines as he will come and share with us immediately after the greatest choir in the world will minister to us. Minister to us. Father, what a joy it is for me to stand tonight before your people. And as I stand here, I do recognize my inabilities to do anything without you, but I can do all things through you that strengthen me. So I pray tonight that you will anoint me afresh and let me minister with clarity. The word that I speak, let it bring increase into the heart of every hearer. And now, Satan, I do serve notice on you tonight that your powers, they are broken. Your contracts are canceled. And I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to cease and desist in your tactics and maneuvers. You are not welcome here tonight. God, because we have gathered in your name, speak to us and speak through us. Now, I thank you for your blood that covers me, for your anointing that rests upon me, more than anything, I thank you for hearing my prayer, as you always do. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray and let every heart say amen. amen. Before you take your seat, shake two or three people's hand and tell them God has a miracle for you tonight. Tonight is your night. God bless you. What a joy it is for me to stand before you and I honor God through Jesus Christ who the scriptures have declared that God has caused him to become sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be saved. When I first got saved, it was because I didn't want to go to hell. But I've been living this life long enough and enjoyed so much until I'd serve him if there were no hell. What about you? We want to honor our leader. We thank God for our chief apostle, Bishop Charles Blake. What a joy. And thank you for trusting me tonight with this microphone. This is not an easy place to stand. And I appreciate the confidence that you have in me. And of course, to the first assistant presiding bishop, Bishop Brooks, God bless you. And of course, the second assistant presiding bishop, Bishop Macklin, and to the general board. And of course, to the chairman of the board of bishops who blessed our hearts on yesterday in the word of God, Bishop Sheard, God bless you, and to uh, Mother Rivers, sainted mother, and her assistant, Mother McCool, God bless you, to the first lady of this, juris of this, of this church, thank God for uh, Mother Blake, Lady Blake, got that right, I love you, such a beautiful example for women, and to all of you that are here tonight, of course, I had the privilege of being considered Bishop Gilbert Earl Patterson's spiritual son, and when he left this life, he left me a wonderful sp spiritual mother. I thank God for Mother Patterson. I love her dearly. 
I also want to give special honor to Bishop Cedric Daniels, who uh, not only has been a friend over the years, he's also uh, was my jurisdictional bishop, and I appreciate him. Something happened a few months ago, and, and I just want to thank him. My mother was diagnosed with uh, cancer in the fourth stage, and uh, it metastasized to her bones and her lungs and her lipnoids. Cancer was in her blood. It was all through her body. And the doctors had already told her that they couldn't do anything but help her along the way. So Bishop Daniels decided in his convocation to have her come and to celebrate her life with his convocation and allow me to minister the word. So I just wanted to thank you for that, Bishop Daniels. Uh, your kindness will never be forgotten. I also want to thank God for the love of my life, the mother of my only two children who on next year I will celebrate 35 years of marriage to my beautiful wife, Pamela Hines. Will you please stand, sweetheart? I love her with all of my heart. She and Jesus are the best two things that have ever happened to me. Uh, not necessarily in that order, but you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I have some people here with me today uh, who um, I'm surprised that they came because I, they hear me minister all the time. Of course, some people from Milwaukee, but my family members are here. I attend the church that I pastor. I have six sisters and three brothers, and all of us are living and they all attend the church that I pastor. I think all three of my brothers are here tonight and two of my sisters. Uh, where are you all at? Please stand, I want, I want, stand up. All three, three of my brothers, all three of my brothers and my two sisters, thank you. I, if I had had my way, I would have had you up on the platform to show you off. My two sons are here, Daryl and Brandon, the only two sons I have. Stand up, boys, I want the people to see my sons. And. Um, they assist me there in the city of Milwaukee in ministry. And I'm so fortunate tonight to have my mom in the audience. My mother is a miracle. She is a woman of God. I appreciate her. I will tell you more about her. Will you stand up, mom? And her husband is here with her. Uh, Papa Tim, will you all stand? I thank God for my mom. Stand, Tim. And um, I want to share with her. And just she's going to be sharing, I, I, I believe with all of my heart, I want to share her testimony in just a moment. But I need to go to the Word of God. It is a privilege for me to be here. So get your scriptures and go with me. I was walking down the hallway on Tuesday coming to service, and I walked down with Bishop Sheard. And uh, this is something that has never happened. As we were walking, he been to, began to tell me uh, the word that God had given him for this great convocation. And uh, he said, you know, I'm going to talk about it. And when he started talking, it was very similar to what God was giving me. And uh, he told me it was the same scripture text and when he got up and began to preach, I mean he preached the same scripture text. Even to the point to where I was sitting in my seat saying, now wait a minute God, I thought you gave me that word. I, I thought you gave me that word. And so I went back to my room again and, and I went into uh, my prayer closet, but the Lord gave me the same scripture text so I imagine it is some message God wants to deliver to this church. And so if you will get your Bibles and go with me to Jude, we will, t uh, Bishop, I tried to get around it, but I'm gonna go on and obey the Lord tonight. Uh, go with me to Jude, we're going to the first verse of the first, of the first verse of Jude. Uh, and we will read through the fourth verse. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the third verse says that he wanted in his message to have the saints to, to contend earnestly for the faith. I want to talk to you tonight about when saints or when saints contend. All right. uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction to Bishop Wells, thank you. Uh, time is a peculiar construct. 
it, it is one of the world's deepest mysteries. Nobody can say exactly what time is, yet our ability to measure time has made our way of life possible. Uh -huh. We have circulated the clock to the spinning of the earth that if you say 12 o'clock in any one place, you have the proper time. It is amazing because we uh, in our nation have periods of time, some called daylight saving times that we just entered out. But how many of you know that time really cannot be saved? It cannot be put in a capsule and reserved for later use. Uh, if we could save time, many of us would have closets full of it, saving it for a later date. But the saying is, is that Father Time marches on. Am I right about it? And so we understand then that there are two things we can look forward to that time is going to definitely do. First of all, time will give us a certainty. There are certain things that you know it's going to happen in just a matter of time. Am I right about it? The Bible tells us in Genesis, the 8th chapter, the 22nd verse, it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and hot and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease so we know for a certainty if we keep living we will run into winter right. keep living we will run into spring we will run into summer and then into fall we know that if you sow a seed it is responsible to produce a fruit or a harvest that are that, that is a certainty that this will happen in, in time so time because of its, uh, 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 of, of its consistency, we can just wait and know of a certain that certain things are going to happen. Uh, can I get a church in here? We also understand that not only does time present to us certainty, but it also presents to us change. There are certain things, it's inevitable that it's going to change. Uh, just give me a few moments. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter and the first verse, that we are to remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Here the writer is speaking about the transitioning of age, how that when you are a young man, there are certain things you never have to consider. But over time, certain things are inevitable. Uh, I can say that again, uh, as a young man, there are certain things that you never have to consider. But if you continue to live, you're going to have to take into consideration some things that your father took into consideration. Uh, am I right about it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm getting older now. I, I work hard at trying to look younger, but I know I'm getting older. It's not because somebody told me, but time has told me that I'm getting older. Uh, am I right about it? Yeah. Sometimes I stand at the bottom of the steps trying to figure out, did I just go up or uh, did I just come down or do I need to go up? I, I don't understand that, but that, that happens to me. I used to, I used to just go to bed. Now I got to get ready for bed. It's, it's, a, it's a whole different element. Yes, I know I'm telling the truth. I, I used to just brush my teeth. Now I got to take care of my teeth. I used to just comb my hair, but now I got to fix my hair. Yeah, y'all laughing at me, but it's a whole lot of Lady Clairol and just for men in this room tonight, y'all. Because we can say of a certainty that there are some things that time itself is going to bring about a change. But my brothers and sisters, as we look into our world today and we see change that is inevitable, I must say that there are some things yet we need not change. Some things we need to work hard at remaining the same. Am I right about it? It is interesting in the church that I pastored there in the city of Milwaukee, my wife and I, we started this church. I felt impressed that she would stand by me so we could be an appealing couple to families. We understand that in America, the very nature of family is under attack the way that we know it to be. And so about a month ago, we were in our family day. And so I was addressing our church. We had our family fest where we come together outside with rides, present family activities. And then that fifth Sunday was the service that we have our children, youth, and everyone in our services. And I'll begin to address them. Now, the Sunday, the Saturday night, 
before I got there on my way to another church that I pastor in Green Bay, Wisconsin that we started, the Lord began to deal with me about family day. And uh, I got home, I was tired, so I didn't get a chance to study it, so I figured I would wake up early Sunday morning and do the research that was in my heart. Well, when I woke up, I began to study something else and it wasn't clicking. And I said, wait a minute, God, what did you tell me? What was it that you told me? And the Lord spoke to my heart seriously and said, I want you to look up the definition of family in a dictionary that you had when you were much younger back in the 80s. And I want you to take that definition and I want you to compare that definition to the dictionary that you use every day in your iPhone for family. And so I did exactly what he said. I went to the dictionary that I had uh, from the 1980s, and I began to research the definition, and it said this, family, a father, a mother, and their children living as a group, the children of the father and mother, the offspring, a group of people living in the same house under one head, including parents, children, relatives, servants. It also in its description said the husband, the wife, they had three girls and two boys. They made a family. Well, you find in the scriptures in Genesis that that's very close in paralleling what God says a family is to be. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, they be, she be, shall be joined to their wives and they shall become one flesh. The Bible says that we are to be fruitful and multiply. So we understand that at one time in America, our very definition of family paralleled what scriptures declared it to be. Yet when you look in the dictionary today, and I just took my iPhone, I happen to have my wife's phone with me because I left mine, but the definition now says a group of individuals living under one roof and usually under one head. Did you hear what I just said? So they have, in our present, changed the definition of family. Let, let me say that again. You, you may read on down where they, they go on and talk about a group of persons, common ancestry, of people uh, regarding, deriving from common stock. It, it doesn't say what it said 26 years ago. Can, can I share with you how important it is that even though there's some things change, there's some things we ought to leave the same? They, they ought not change? We live in a very confused world and we're giving confusing messages. Now pets are called children because families are no longer defined as husbands and wives and their children living under one roof. But I'm here to tell you a dog is not your son. It, it's a dog. Your, your daughter is not a poodle. It, it, you, you don't have a, your son is not a pot belly pig. That's an animal. That's that's not a child, and I don't care how you fix it or how many trinkets you put on its fur, or how many collars you wrap around them, or what clothes you dress them in. Your dog is not your child. Yeah, the Bible says that you have to be fruitful and multiply, and it is these mixed messages, if you all will give me a few moments, it is these mixed messages that we as the church have to take note to. We cannot sit back enjoying our religious experience and not bring attention to their changing definitions of things that matter right before our eyes. I, I don't hear anybody, but that's all right. You see, I want you to recognize words are powerful. Look at somebody and tell them words are powerful. Look at somebody else and tell them words are powerful. It's interesting. When you give something a name, it takes responsibility. Some of you all may not know that because sometimes we name our children trinkets and we name them after cars and stuff we can't spell. But a name is significant. Uh, what is a name but a word or a phrase that constitute the distinctive designation of a person or a thing? Can I, let me say that again. What is a name but a word or a phrase that constitutes the distinctive designation of a person or a thing. So in reality, a name is supposed to give a limited but accurate definition of the person, place, or thing in which it is attributed to. 
Am I right about it? For example, if I tell you to go to the store and buy me some shoes and you show up with some gloves, it appears that you didn't understand what was included in the word shoes because you went and got some gloves. Are you listening to me? You see, it can be confusing when you call something one thing by name and when you call it something else shows up. You, you call a boy and a girl comes. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's where we're going. You, you call a marriage and two men show up. It, it, it can be real confusing. It can be real confusing. When you call something a name that is supposed to bring definition to it, and then something entirely different shows up in the place of the name that you called. I wish I had a church in here. Uh, we, we're facing some challenges, uh, people of God. There are some things we have to reconsider and reassess. Don't use the name if it's not defined in what you call it. Remember this. I, I, I'm looking at something. You, we're confusing people. We, and now don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. But we've been confusing people for a while because there are some names we're using in the church. But when you show up, it ain't what you said. You, you, you got to understand when you use the name saint. Yeah. You don't just use the name saint and then when you look up, something else shows up. There, there's a responsibility. When you say that, see, 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 let me, let me show you and bring clarity as to how the application of this applies. See, you got to remember that, 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 that we have become so accustomed to calling ourselves Christians. Now, no, 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 don't get mad at me. But Christian really doesn't define us. It, it only categorizes us. That's, it, it puts us in a category. Because when you look at the word Christian itself is not something that speaks to who we really are. Ah, Lord, help me. Now, look at its origin, even the definition of it. It literally means follower of Christ. Now, you got to understand there was all kind of people following Christ. Yeah, yeah, there were all kind of people. As a matter of fact, the word in its origin doesn't even start with us. It starts with the world. The Bible says, if you know the scriptures, it says that it was at Antioch that they were first called Christians. Am I right about it? It was at Antioch where they were first called Christians. And then, it's only in the scriptures three times. Twice as Christian and then once as Christians. You, 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 you understand that the second time you hear the word is in Acts the 26th chapter and it is used as Paul is defending himself before these men, one by the name of Festus and the other one named Agrippa. He says, uh, uh, Pastor Bishop Wright did a wonderful job of taking us through Paul's transition. So here in the 26th chapter, Paul is stating his case, and he puts Agrippa on the spot when he says to him, you do believe uh, the prophets, and you do believe, you know, and Agrippa was in a particular spot because he knew that Festus had just called Paul a fool. So he didn't want to lose face with Festus. At the same time, he didn't want to upset the prophecy of the Jews because he was in so, what does he do? He says, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. That was not complimenting. That was almost sarcastically. It wasn't an accomplishment. That's why Paul, when he responded to him, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today, watch this, might become both almost and altogether such as I am without these chains he says I want you to be what I am Paul said I didn't he didn't say I want you to become a Christian he said I want you to be as I am uh, yeah you've got to understand that it is it, it, it there, there is no God help me Holy Ghost there is no God definition in the word Christian don't get mad at me there is no God definition in the word Christian because it didn't start with God. 
it's taught to men. Only one apostle uses the word Christians, and he uses it in encouragement. I, I wish I really had time to really tell you what's in my heart, but for the sake of time, let me just go through it. He tells them how they ought to know how to suffer, and some ways they ought not to suffer. This is Peter. He says this in 2 Peter when he talks to the church. He tells them in the fourth chapter, excuse me, 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, he tells them, now you got to know that you are going to suffer as, as a Christian. Now, and what he's saying by that is people see you as Christians, you're going to suffer as a result of that. But then he, before he tells them that, he says there's some things you ought not suffer as. You don't suffer as a murderer, an evildoer, or a busybody in other folks' matters. We skip that whole verse. So, uh, yeah, let me finish. And so, and so hear me, y'all. So, so we got to be careful because when you say Christian, anything is liable to show up. I, I know it's hard. That's how come you got Christians who, who declare to be Christians, yet they fornicate all the time. You got people declaring to be Christians, but they live together as husband and wife, never under the word of You got whole churches and denominations that will call themselves Christians, and the minister itself declares to be a homosexual openly. Why? Because Christians as a word does not find its origin in God. And anything that a man speaks, he can define. But that is not quite the same. That is not the same, though, when you use the word saint. Because saint doesn't start with you. Comparatively, while Christian is in the scripture, only three times the word saint or saints collectively is in the Bible 101 times. First in Deuteronomy 33 and 2, and lastly in Revelations 20 and 9. 14 times God calls us his saints. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 2 and 9 that God will keep the feet of his saints. You see, the Bible lets us know is that the saints that are in the earth, according to Psalm 16 and 3, the saints that are in the earth, so that knocks out the Catholic saints who can't become saints until they're dead. They, yeah, 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 you switch me. You got it, man. So, 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 so what am I trying to say? Well, we need to understand what the word saint really means in order to really, when we use it, be it. Or don't use it if we're not going to be it. Y'all ain't got to like me. I was struck by lightning dead for 45 minutes. God gave me my life back. What else can you do to me? If we're going to use it, let's be it and not use it and not be it. You must understand that the word saint in the Hebrew and in the Greek is the same word for holy. There are no separation between the word saint and the word holy. And so when you mention saint, in the Old Testament, it is the same word for holy, which is kadosh, which means to be set apart, dedicated to sacred purposes. Holy, sacred, clean, morally, or ceremonially pure. The verb kadosh, it means to set apart something or someone for purposes that are holy. Holiness is the, is the separation from everything profane and defiled. And at the same time, it is dedicated to everything that is holy and pure. Go into the New Testament. It is sacred. It is called hagio, sacred, blameless, consecrated, separated, properly worthy of veneration. It is God-likeness. Somebody shout God-likeness. Innermost nature of God, set apart for God, reserved for God and his services. Since nothing that is polluted then can be called hagios, 
purity, watch this now, becomes the first part of Hagios. That's how come God, when he declares himself to his people, he says that I, the Lord your God, am holy. And anything that's associated with the holy God, not because of your name, but because of your association. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anything that's associated with a holy God has to first become holy within itself. Notice in the scriptures, God, when he spoke to Abraham, he told him that he was God. When he spoke to Moses, he told him to take his shoes off because he was on holy ground. When God began to establish the temple, which would be the place that would hold his glory, he called it a holy building according to Exodus 28 and 29. All the sacrifices were holy according to Exodus 29 and 33. All the ceremonial material, the oil, the utensils, the table, the vessels, the candlestick, the Sabbath day had to be holy. When God got priests, he told the priests they had to be holy. Told the Levites they had to be holy. He told the Nazarites they had to be holy. And when he got a people, Israel, he said, be holy. I the Lord your God. Make a difference. Somebody shout, make a difference. I said, somebody shout, make a difference. We have to be so careful because... When he gave us his spirit, I preached a message once entitled, and I'm just about finished, will the real church please identify itself? And in my declaration in that text, I saw that we were sending confusing messages to the world because the world began to throw back at us definitions of what we should be under the umbrella of love. Am I right about it? And they'll tell you, if you love me, then you accept me. Love me like I am, cause God loved me like that. But you must understand that love is not God's identity. Love is God's ability. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love isn't his identity, it's his ability. When you speak of God's love, his love is something that shows he so gave, yeah, 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 his only begotten son. That, whosoever believeth in him. So love is what you give. Notice there are several definitions for the word love. But when you talk about God's identity, you talk about who he is throughout all generation. He is a holy God. And if you go walk around here with the banner of saints on your shoulder or the halo of saints around your head, you better live holy. Let's stop playing. Look at somebody and tell them, let's stop playing. Let, let, let's stop playing. Let, let's stop playing, y'all. Let, let's stop doing our own thing and, and still call ourselves saints. Let's, let, let's, let's stop playing. Let, let's stop making our own plans and then declaring ourselves to be saints. Look at somebody and tell them, let's stop playing. Let, let, let's stop playing games. Let's stop messing around with the devil. Let's, let's get him straight tonight. Let, let him know tonight, somebody in this building, they're going to leave here as saints. They're going back to their communities as saints. The Bible tells us here in our text, and I'm closing now. Our text is an interesting text because it is a man's expression to a people, a people that have used the Word of God to their own advantage. And so he speaks to them. There are three things that I want to bring out of this text before I finish, and I promise you I'll be done. When he writes here, this writer Jude, he, he writes as a servant of God, and he expresses this letter, and I wouldn't dare try to do the history. You did a great job with it. So what I want to do is I just want to cut through to the things that he speaks of that cause these men to get caught up. First of all, you must understand that the message itself was not just to the church in general, but it was first to individuals in the church. Yeah, yeah, did you get what I just said? It wasn't just for the church in general, but it was for individuals because the way he speaks, he says, first of all, there are certain men. He first says, I want you to contend. That word contend there means that you struggle or that you put forth an effort or that you resist and fight against. That's speaking of personal persons. That's not talking about me struggling with Bishop Daniels or fighting with Bishop Daniels. It has nothing to do with another man. It has everything to do with me maintaining my holiness or my saintly calling according to God. So he's saying that you got to fight 
You got to fight some of the things that's going to come against you. You got to resist some of the temptations. You can't, everybody can't be from LA. Somebody got to be from praying. Somebody got to be from fasting. I don't mean no harm by that, Bishop. Please do not hear that. But we got people on TV. No, I don't want to go there. Let me just keep going. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. I'm not, I don't want to say anything. I'm not here to condemn anybody just to bring attention to what he's saying here. And so he says there are certain men, watch what he said, certain men who have creeped in, certain men who have creeped in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and denying the only Lord God, Jesus Christ. Right. He says, I want to remind you of who they are. Three things that they fall under. First of all, the, first, the, first, the faith is corrupt by men who are self-centered and unloving in their behavior. Self-centered and unloving in their behavior. He says, but these I speak evil. He says in the 10th verse, whatever they do, what they, he says, whatever they do not know the whatever they know naturally like brute beasts in these things they corrupt themselves how woe to them for they have gone the way of Cain and have run greedily in error of Balaam for profit and perishing rebellion of Korah in other words they have been so selfish and so self-driven so self-centered until godliness does no longer penetrate them. They have lost the struggle. The second thing that he brings attention to is that these men are immoral or they have sensual lifestyles. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, laid autumn trees without fruit, Christ dead, plucked up by the root, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars from whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever, raging, screeching with no anointing, talking loud, ain't saying nothing, won't attention, just brought to themselves. I ain't scared of none of y'all. I'm going to finish this tonight. And the third category, these are men who are distorted and deceitful in their teaching. Notice what it says, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. It says here that their mouths greatly swelled words, flattering people, but gain to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the word which was spoken before by the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause division having not the spirit of God. We got to go back to the word. Bishop Moody was talking the truth tonight. got to stop doing everything that we can't find in the Word and feel justified within ourselves. You are men and women of God under the umbrella of being saints. If you can't find what you're doing in the Bible, you ought to stop doing it. I don't care how it makes you feel. I don't care how much authority it gives you. I don't care how it makes you look. If you can't find that in the Bible, stop doing it. Stop causing contention. Stop causing division. Stop calling the breakdown of fellowship. I know you don't want to hear the Bible, but the Bible tells us there's certain things that saints just don't do. Lord, do I have time? Do I have time? Do I have time? Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians. I got to tell you what the Word says. 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. I'm not talking about anything but the truth. It says to us in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, or in, excuse me, the first chapter, it says in the second verse, it says, it says, first of all, you are called to be saints. Look at somebody and tell them, before you were called a missionary, before you were called uh, uh, an evangelist, yeah. Yeah, yeah, before you were called, uh, y'all ain't got to like, before you were called a bishop, you, 
You will come. Slap somebody high five and tell them that's your first calling. Tell them that's your first calling. Then he goes on to the sixth chapter and says, dare any of you having a matter against another, go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Who do you think you are? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you understand who we are to God? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to be to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we are judges of angels? How much more things than pertaining this life? If then you have judgment concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brother. But brothers go into the law against brothers and before unbelievers. Now therefore, it is already an utter failure that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? No, you yourself do wrong and cheat and do these things to your brother. Do you not? I'm going to read the word. Don't say I said nothing. Just You ain't going to leave his saying. And then guess what else he said? I'm going to tell you what the Bible said. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, no idolaters, no adulterers, no homosexuals, no sodomites, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revelers, extortioners. You won't inherit the kingdom of God. Then he closes his writing by saying in such well, some of you. You, you were washed, but you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and by the Spirit of God, uh, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful to me. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. He goes on and says to them, he says, now concerning the things which I wrote you, he goes on to talk about what it is good for a man not to do. When I go back over to the book of Jude and I close my text out today, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's time for the saints to contend. Before you work on me, work on yourself. Before you try to change me, turn the light on yourself. For I heard them say, they used to sing a song that said, search me, Lord. Please search me, Lord. Turn the light from heaven on my soul. And if you find anything that should not be, take it out. Uh, take it out and strengthen me. I want to be right. Can I get a witness in here? I want to be saved. I got to be whole. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's going to be all right if we just do what the word says. Build up your beloved brothers. He says you got to build up yourself in your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost, getting back on your knees and saying, God, how do you want me to handle it? Saying, God, what are you saying about it? And the Holy Ghost will step in and intercede according to Ephesians for the saints. Am I right about it? It says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And on some having compassion, uh, making a distinction.
distinction. Look at somebody and tell them, make a distinction. But others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments that defile the flesh. It's time for the church to stop working on each other and start working on the world. I'm tired of you prophesying to me, but you don't win nobody to Jesus. If you are a saint, then get busy and do what you're called to do. Because when you do that, God will help you out. For he closes the book by saying, now unto him that is able, look at somebody and tell him he's able, he has all power. He's able, he has all authority. He's able to keep you from falling and to present your faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, who alone is wise. Be glory, dominion, power forever. Slap your neighbor, high five and said, neighbor, it's time for us to contend. Go back to your prayer closet. Get in the shut up. Get down on your face and call on God and said, feel me, feel me again. Anoint me, anoint me again. Use me, use me again. Can you see it? I'm closing now. Lord, have mercy. You see the world, they're looking at us closely. If we done made a mistake, Mother, I mean, First Lady, we have put the paintbrush in the hand of the world. And we've told them to paint our image. And whenever you give the world the paintbrush to paint your image, they will never make your God look favorable. And so somebody has to say, God said it, and then we see it. Y'all ain't gonna like being here. We gotta stop saying it, and don't nobody see it. If we say God will save you, then you be saved. If we say God's gonna heal you, then see some folk healed. Can I tell my mama's testimony? I'm gonna tell it and she's gonna come. But I want you to know, last year, in the convocation, I got a call from home. They said, Daryl, you need to come home. Mama got to talk to you. When I got home, my mama said, listen, the doctors told me that cancer has come back, but this time it has come back to kill me. She said the doctor was so touched, he was telling me it was in my lymph nodes. It was in my liver, in my lungs, all in my blood. It was all metastasized to my bones. I was in the fourth stage and he began to cry while he was telling me. And he said, you're, you're so calm. He says, I'm more upset than you are. And my mother said, the reason I'm calm is because of my relationship with God. Then she came to church and she told the saints, look at me. Cancer's all over my body and it's come to kill me. But I want you to know it can't kill me. It can't kill me because while cancer's in my body, God is in my body. And I want you to know if God, I oh, if God be for me, who can be against me? If God is on my side, who can hinder me? She said, I ain't gonna die. She said, I ain't gonna die. She said, the fire came and killed the three evil boys, but it couldn't kill them, even though it was hot, because God was in the flame with them. She said, that Daniel was in the den with hungry lions, but they couldn't eat him, because God was in the den with them. She said, cancer is in my body, 
but it can't kill me because God is in my body with me. Oh! So my mother kept on going. Last three weeks ago, I was in Oakland, California, leisurely on the golf course after preaching there for Bishop Reams. She called me and said, Daryl, are you sitting down? Thank you for letting me tell it, Mama. I want you to do something in just a moment. She said, I want you to know I went to the doctors. They tested me all over. They couldn't find no trace of cancer in me. Nothing in my lungs. Nothing in my blood. Nothing in my liver. Nothing in my kidney. Then she began to sing this song. Mama, sing a little of that song. Play. That, I tell you, there's a miracle in this place. 
place right now. I dare you to put a down payment on your miracles and give God a praise on it. Hey, glory. Come on and praise it. I need you to do me a favor. We've been doing a whole lot, but it's time for the church to struggle, to contend, and let the devil know there's still somebody who's a saint for the law. If I'm talking to you, I want you to go to three people, shake their hands and tell them it's time to contend. It's time to contend for the faith. Clap your hands and praise it. Take me down to East Lab. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. This is what you came here for. I'm telling you, God told me that he was going to do miracles in this place tonight. If you will give God time, He'll heal your body right now. If you give God time, He'll save your child at home. If you give God time right now, He'll give you a breakthrough. So come on and praise the Lord. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. The glory is about to fall in this place. The glory is about to fall in this place. Will you give God just a few more moments of praise? Come on, come on, people.
Take somebody by the hand right now. Sometimes we gotta make the place where we stand the altar of our transition. Whoa, whoa. Sometimes we have to make the place we stand the altar of our transition. Transition. Time nor space will allow us to touch everybody that needs to be touched. So the Bible said he sent his word and healed them. I believe that the presence of God is here tonight in such a profound way. Until when I pray, souls will be saved, lives will be rededicated, and people will be healed. I believe it. Take someone's hand right now. Don't let anybody be standing by themselves. Touch somebody, come on. Sing with me, how great. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for your heat. And I was in, yeah, I was in prayer today, and the Lord spoke to me and said there would be three people in here healed of cancer. You'll tell somebody you're in here tonight because there would be three people in here healed of cancer. You'll tell somebody you're in here tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your presence that's here. And your presence is not just to make us feel good but it is to do all the things that only you can do. Heal the bodies of your people. Be healed in your bodies. All blood conditions. All heart conditions. That lying spirit cancer. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. We declare the healing power of the Lord to transition this place. From one, yeah, to shake about, from one side of this room to the other. And then, Father, save in this place. Deliver and set free. If you're not saved, just tell him to come into my heart and save me now. And he'll do it. God, last but not least, let us contend for ourselves. Let us resist the powers that pull on us, that causes us to be sensual and to be selfish and to be self-serving but help us to seek your face to be saints so that when we show up in any setting you show up because your heritage is in the saints you said your heritage is in the saints who you are is in us so help us to declare it and be it we leave this place as saints we leave this conference as saints Holy is not a denomination, it's not a religion, it's not a church, it's an identity. We leave here as saints, and we bless you for it. Thank you for watching the Jonathan Desparty Gospel Channel. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and get your...